Hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the host of the Prostate Cancer Lab meeting. Uh, today, we have three items on the agenda. We want to update you on a conversation that was triggered out of our last uh, meeting, which was right to see uh, the idea that uh, patients should have access to research use only data that is run on them. Uh, second is Rick is going to lead us through um, his treatment situation, uh, his history, and, and the decisions that he's facing now as a kind of a setup for people in general uh, with advanced prostate cancer. And then also he's gonna share the data that we have on him and Brian McCluskey uh, and talk about analyses that he'd like to see run. Um, so that's our agenda for the day. Um, let me just uh, 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 update you on the conversation quickly uh, that we had uh, with Nick Shork, uh, Peter Kuhn, in particular, Marty Tenenbaum, um, and what they suggest, there, there, there are varieties of ways to get around the roadblock on patients getting access to research use only data. Um, one is to have a workaround with an IRB that Nick Short talked about um, that, that Rick has gotten. Another is to broaden that and expand that. And that's what we're talking about. And apparently we can set up an observational feasibility trial, which lowers the barrier on like a classic randomized clinical trial, which is prospective and uh, is very expensive and slow. So we're working on that and trying to find principal investigators and or um, organizations that would fund such a research activity. Uh, so if you know anyone who's a, a PI, potentially a PI or a research uh, organization that would want to fund that kind of work, um, let us know. Uh, anything on that, Rick? Uh, and, and of course, the other front is to go through uh, the, the regular channel. So Rick's trying through the City of Hope to get his tissue uh, through the tests and the machines that they have that would be CLIA certified or that would be accessible to his oncologist. Um, anything to say on that front, Rick, about the, the general right to see um, for, for your, uh, you know, for these advanced tests? Not specifically. It seems like things, but generally, uh, it seems like TGen is moving ahead with uh, uh, getting approvals to work with Akoya and Nabel. Uh, the reason I can't say specifically is Akoya and Nabel doesn't want to talk to a patient. <clears throat> they want to talk to uh, TGen who has the protocol in place. So I'm kind of boxed out. I get a little update that things are moving ahead. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that because I would like to be the first of many this <clears throat> and I'm really interested with what Rick Davis is going to say, because, uh, you know, we had such a good conversation last week, but in general, um, I'd like to see this uh, available to everyone who uh, has the means. Uh, I think it's pretty modest, a few thousand dollars. So, um, just a generality, I think it's getting closer, but I don't know specifically. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't mind uh, inviting a little uh, introduction for uh, a few people that I don't know and that I'd like to welcome. Uh, if I don't know Chandra, Chandra or Jan or H. Messerly, um, if you guys wanted to just say a quick hello, uh, uh, I thought it was very interesting to get the little background from, uh, you know, Saeed and, uh, Alex. So if, if you guys wouldn't mind, uh, just saying a quick hello. Sure. I'll go first. I'm Chandra Kota. I'm, uh, what you call is a medical physicist. I don't know if uh, any of you have had radiation treatments before you would know. Yes. Uh, I'm currently working at Yale. I'm interested in um, looking beyond just my immediate job, day-to-day -day job, and see how I can uh, help patients out with some, maybe some of the newer radiation treatments and ideas coming out of, of the research field. Beautiful. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Masterly. I'm at Sirtis Oncology in um, San Diego, Sorrento Valley. Um, we work with mice creating OPDX models of patient cancer tumors and then test different treatments and therapies on them to see which work and do not work. Um, I'm not a scientist, I'm the patient manager here and I'm learning so much by sitting in on this, but I'm just want, if anything pops up that it seems like Sirtis might be able to step in and help, I'll definitely let you know. And if you're in the San Diego area and you want to visit our facility, you can. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Heather. Um, just uh, to so just to work in one of longevity. And, and that's one of many, I'm sorry, that just the, what CERTIS represents is one of many kind of vectors that we're exploring or work streams, and that's mm -hmm. the, the organoid and, and testing. And so CERTIS offers traditionally uh, mouse models. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yes. um, and, and Brian is in the, the San Diego area. So we're hoping that we can have that conversation and see if it would be suitable because um, both Rick and Brian, and I think other patients, you know, they, they, they sort of go, uh, this, I'm not, I don't mean to say this badly, but they bounce between treatments. Mm -hmm. And so they're constantly in the mode of testing. And so they have the ability to take a long lead time in terms of getting a testing environment set up for themselves because they're gonna be coming back to uh, decisions repeatedly. Yes. So they, they, I think the, the profile of the prostate cancer patient fits for the CERTIS mm -hmm. services. Yes. Okay. And, and Jan, um, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I've been here before. I think I've met Rick, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm patient. I'm just a patient. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I have castration sensitive prostate cancer still, so I'm lucky in that way. I just inquired at, with my doctor as to whether I could get the lutetium 177. They said nay, because I have to have, have to be castration resistant and I have to be have to have the taxol treatment and you know basically I have to be further along in my journey I guess before I can access that technology so um anyway that's about it uh, thank you yeah great. I think we'll get into that I think Rick will tee that up Rick we have two Ricks I think <laughs> Rick's Rick Stan will tee that up and I expect Rick Davis to uh to comment as well on all these uh, the treatment options and the considerations of prostate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off my video because I'm eating and stuff, so I don't want didn't want to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're in. I think he's in the Seattle area, so I understand when Laura's having lunch, but it's 9 a.m., so I don't know. Maybe late breakfast. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, next topic, uh, Rick, uh, take it away. I, I assume you want to start with. Uh, there were two topics. One is uh, treatment. And then the other is the data that we have that would inform that treatment. So I assume you're going to, um, uh, you know, lead us through that conversation. And I would encourage everyone to, you know, interrupt with questions as we go to make it more conversational. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, I thought I'd start off with uh, how am I doing? It's always when I was on other hackathons, it was always interesting. Uh, you know, how is the patient doing? Well, I had some good news this week and I always like to share good news. Um, I think it's a little crazy that I get my PSA uh, blood work done at the same time I get my uh, docetaxel infusion. Uh, especially when you're near the end of your rounds, I just completed six rounds with, uh, and I got a 80% infusion because I started getting tingling in my fingers. Uh, I am a guitarist and, you know, I, I want to live more than I want to play guitar, but uh, I, I guess it's standard protocol. If you report you have, uh, you're starting neuropathy, they immediately cut you to 80% and that's just how it works, I guess. I don't know. That's what happened to me. So uh, I then wait, get my infusion and I wait on pins and needles and hope uh, to find out that my PSA went down, which it did. Not a lot, but it went down. Um, so I'm at 2.4. Last time was 2.6. The time before was 2.4. So I, I feel like I'm just bouncing around in uh, noise around 2.4, 2.5. So uh, I'm still, to my awareness, being controlled. And so uh, I have another 
um, chemo's planned, uh, even though I'm at six. And at the start of the chemo, I was advised to, I would be going six to 10. Um, so uh, I think the plant, my doctor is Dr. Lou, Sandy Lou. She's the head of a clinical trial at UCLA, um, Arcus 6. Arcus is uh, my good pals. Uh, I used to work with their management uh, at Amgen, and they started a company called Arcus. Um, very good small molecule company. Um, and I'm on the clinical trial, which is docetaxel, um, a PD-1 uh, inhibitor, and an adenosine inhibitor. And I had hoped to get on that trial arm, but unfortunately, I just got on uh, the docetaxel only because it was... Uh, not double blind, but it was randomized and I just didn't get the luck of the draw. So uh, I need to make a treat, uh, altered treatment decision upcoming. Uh, and I'm happy to say uh, I don't have as much pressure if my uh, PSA was going up and you know the scans were showing uh, growth, uh, I'd be under uh, time pressure. Uh, but now it looks like I have a little time. So that's, that's my update. I'm, I'm pretty happy to tell you that. Um, any, any questions? Did I cover that okay? Dr. Laird, anything that you would, as an MD coming fresh to this, anything you would have questions about as a background? Just the extent of the disease, where is it located and what was previous treatment? Sure. Um, I'd love to cover that in a, in a moment because uh, I've tried to develop a, a one slide or somehow succinctly communicate my state. And so you will be the new guinea pig. Uh, I've communicated this to my uh, three medical oncologists and they all said, well, it's okay. And when I saw Brian's depiction of his state, which was a, a PSA uh, chart in his journey of uh, interventions and PSA, uh, I saw how much more lively that was but uh, here's my state. Um, um, but uh, kind of like an outline of what I'm hoping to go through just to kind of go through it is my decision, uh, my treatment guidelines down the NCCN decision tree and uh, how I'm reaching the end of that decision tree and how I would desire my maybe upcoming therapy options to be influenced by me personally, my cancer state, um, immune genomic and patient state. And so I'm hoping it's going to be informed by uh, an IHC at a minimum of something like we're seeing on the right here, um, where these are four um, tumor slices, um, the upper left, and this is a, the brown is a CD3 stain. So this, that's uh, T cells, uh, you know, the uh, combination of CD4, CD8, and T regs. And you can see abundance in the upper left of brown. So, you know, this um, tumor is what would be called inflamed or hot or uh, loaded with uh, TILs or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. On the right, you see it's cold. There's no... Um, CD3, um, you know, T cells are, are not infiltrating this tumor. On the lower left, <clears throat> you would see that uh, if you did an RNA seq, you would think that you you have good infiltration, uh, but you can see that uh, uh, I'd call it the moat of exclusion. There's an immunosuppression that the T cells are unable to cross this boundary. And in the lower right, you can see um, basically a very low uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but they're there. The reason I bring this up, these four states, is they could, I mean, to any researcher who understands how T cells work, this would influence uh, your selection of uh, uh, immunotherapy. You know, either uh, you need to do a, if you're here, you need to do a prerequisite or, you know, just 
hope for a miracle that you'd be one of the few people that respond with no infiltration. So anyway, um, how did that go? Did, any questions on that? And which, you know, which do you look like? I don't know. So uh -huh. uh, I'm about to share my state to my awareness. I'm waiting on IHC, which stands for immunohistochemistry, which is this stain. It's an immunohistochemistry stain where uh, a pathologist will uh, add a stain that, which will bind selectively to whatever they uh, are looking for. In this case, it's CD3. Uh, so I'm waiting on that from City of Hope. Uh, it was requested by Tanya Dorf, which was a beautiful thing. I'm on the phone with her and I said, uh, well, could I just uh, get an IHC done? Because this is a um, subset of what we're seeking to do here at the hackathon and um, open up for other patients is, this is what I'd call spatial analysis. And uh, Akoya, Enable, Nanostring all do very deep queries and uh, they're not mainstream and they're research use only, but uh, I'm hoping to do uh, what is standard uh, IHC and uh, compare it with some of these other technologies to make sure they all kind of say the same thing. So I, I certainly hope and any patient would hope that they're uh, in the upper left or at least the um, lower right, you wanna have, if you have no, uh, like if you're in the upper right and you're cold and you have no tumor infiltrating lymphocytes uh, to human awareness, immuno common, like a PD-L1 blockade uh, inhibition is not gonna work because <laughs> there's no uh, T cells to modulate here. Um, so uh, let me get back to my next slide, which is, this is going to be a dense slide, but I'm hoping that it'll communicate where I'm at. Um, and uh, Rick, could I make a comment on that? Please. Or? Yes, please. So um, thank you for that. Uh, there, your upper right hand slide to give um, immune therapy is probably a waste, as you probably know. Um, it's not not likely to be beneficial. So prepping that prepping that microenvironment is really a key. You know, how can that be shifted? Um, always a key issue. There's a group. They're not. Um, sort of set up commercially, but there's a group called Consultative Proteomics at the University of Texas, uh, Dr. Robert Brown that um, I've, I've used. Um, they do, uh, basically it's proteomics. So they're doing IHC stains, 20 or 30 of them on any given tumor. I don't know if you guys have familiar with their work at all. No, that's beautiful. Um, what they do in terms of your particular slide that's directly relevant is um, they will assess um, CD8 cells, which you might say are the ones that are going to be most helpful. Right. Um, FOXP3 cells, which are put on the brakes. And so they look at the number of CD8 cells per high power field, FOXP3 cells per high power field, um, anything two to one or over is considered generally pretty good. Um, and then they'll do CD163s, which are macrophages, which are also key. And uh, macrophages can be in a M1 stage or an M2 stage. And if they're on the M1 part of the, and they transform back and forth. So if they're in the M1 phase, then that's very positive. If they're transformed to M2, then that's another break on the system. So um, that's the most useful thing I found for um, kind of commercially available, but they're, uh, you know, we can get them to, they'll run samples um, they're just not set up to be a high volume lab. And sometimes it takes six weeks to 
or more to get the results back. Um, but they're very helpful. They're you know interested in these kind of things. And this look at the microenvironment was something that my uh, mentor Mark Renneker actually had them set up um, a few years ago. So um, they also have you get a protein fingerprint, which uh, in can give one a sense of which of these genetic changes are actually driving the tumor and which aren't. Um, no oncologists uh, are gonna make any treatment decisions based on this, but in terms of looking at the microenvironment terrain, um, there often are um, off-label products that can be used to help in the micro microenvironment. That's beautiful, John. That's so insightful. <laughs> I feel like, uh, okay, we're ringing the bell here. So uh, uh, I feel like going 20 deep in IHC, um, do you need 20 different slices of tissue? Or is that, are you able to stain and wash? Um, I think they end up with 20 slides. If they can get a hold of the block, uh, they can make a lot thinner slides than the typical path labs. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, offline, glad to help you get set up on that. Are you, are you familiar with the Koya and Nanostrings uh, spatial efforts? I'm not. You're going to love them. Um, so it's uh, immunofluorescence. Um, it's just like an, uh, you know, an IHC. Um, you're able to do it on one slice of tissue. Um, immunofluorescence uh, allows uh, stain and wash. So you're, you're tagging a fluorescent molecule, um, typically red, green, blue, some color to an antibody and you can go in three at a time and resolve the three colors. And so you would pick, let's say CD3, CD4, CD8, Fox, just keep going because you can uh, dissociate, wash away and go in with another three. So they can iteratively build up to very high dimensional. They're, mm. I've heard like a hundred, hundred plex. I know they're operating at 35. Uh, this is both, uh, this is a Koya and Enable. Um, interesting, James Allison is on the board at uh, Enable. So you'll love these guys. It's, it's mm. exactly what you said, except for it's on one slice uh, of tissue. So you have the exact same slice and uh, nice. you're able to query very deeply. And then Nanostring has a different offering also for uh, even even deeper querying of um, um, basically intersections of where, where let's say in this uh, slide in the lower left you would look at the boundary between uh, the tumor which is in the upper left and the immune uh, cells that are trying to get into this tumor so you would query uh, selective boundary areas uh, with the nano string. So, uh, yeah, I think you're going to love it. And uh, more on that to come. Um, and Brad, that'll be in the notes. Yeah, basically, I um, transcribe all this and try to provide links. So, okay, you just mentioned the, the company, which went in one ear and out the other. But when I review the recording, I'll, I'll try to put a link to them in the, in the, in the notes. Yeah, you, you'll love them. Okay, so here's here is me, and I've presented this slide to um, Dr. Raina McKay, uh, Dr. at uh, UC San Diego, and Dr. Tanya Dorf um, at City of Hope. So I try to summarize. It's a dense slide, so I'll just kind of go over, <clears throat> kind of quickly because there are some things that are kind of interesting. So from the row 20 to the bottom is um, my PSA. Um, in 2019, just as a yearly physical, uh, I went from like 3-1 to 4-1. Uh, 
And that's when I found out basically that triggered. Um, so uh, I've had my prostate out. So you can see my treatment history. I've started Lupron, Quesadex. Uh, they held me, that held me stable for eight months. Then darlunamide didn't do much. Uh, now I'm on docetaxel. <clears throat> and you can see me bouncing around. Uh, you know, I came from 3.6 down to 2.4. Okay, so that's that. And then... I desire to be aggressive. So far, I'm fairly healthy. And my, uh, if I look at my treatments, um, I've had salvage radiation, Lupron, uh, Quesadex, Darlutamide, and now Dotdosetaxel. Okay, now, so what do I do next? And this is where it gets more interesting. <clears throat> Rick, I think Dr. Laird was asking about the extent. So you're metastatic. Can you talk about? Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, Yep, I um, a, a nodal disease, uh, four lymph nodes from my neck to my pelvis uh, light up in a PSMA scan and are confirmed in uh, CT scan or MRI, or I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm at nodal stage four um, castrate resistant. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, thanks. Sure, sure. So uh, these this lines three through nine are my asking of my next therapy options, next therapy options. Mm -hmm. So when I talked to Tanya Dorf, <clears throat> she noted, and, and so this is like what evidence would influence her recommendation. So here you can see in line three, the CDK12 mutation is my driving mutation. And that is going to open up uh, a lot of fusion um, neoantigens uh, by nature. And so she is uh, advocating a, uh, this clinical trial uh, that combines uh, bispecific PD-1, CTLA-4, with olaparib. Okay, olaparib is an interesting um, recommendation. It's, uh, it has been approved for CDK12 mutations, but uh, subsequent data shows maybe not that great, um, more uh, for a BRCA uh, one or two, that would be uh, shown some good efficacy, but Olaparib relative to CDK12, what, not so much. So then I asked her, well, why would you recommend this trial? Uh, and a big shout out to Rick Davis because, you know, um, our discussion last week, you know, totally, changed this actually and i'll get to that in a moment but uh she said well you know uh a laparib on its as a single agent probably wouldn't do anything but in combination with the uh uh pd1 and ctla4 um think it might have a good uh fit for me so i said oh, okay um so then we move on so that is what uh we'll, you know, one of the leading medical oncologists recommends for me coming up after uh, chemo. Okay, then Dr. Raina McKay is, as she came up with uh, several to consider with her top one being a PSMA CAR-T. Um, so that sounds <clears throat> pretty good. Um, I don't really know that much about it, but why would she say PSMA? Well. Um, there's two evidence notes that why it'd be a fit for me. Um, population studies would be the first, just like metastatic prostate cancer patient guys like me tend to have a high expression of PSMA. Okay, so that's population study. It was also confirmed in the RNA seq. So I'm super high expressor. So is Brian of uh, 
PSMA, and it was also confirmed by the PSMA scan. So we know that lights up. So anything with a PSMA target uh, is a triple fit for me from just population studies to the scan, do RNA-seq. Okay, this seems to make sense. Another one. Uh, Rick, uh, Dr. Laird has a question. Sure, sure. Um, thank you. It's, uh, it's actually a suggestion. Have, have you worked, and is this group familiar with um, the work of, um, oh God, what's his name? Robert Nagorny down in Long Beach? No. Um, so uh, sort of the bottom line is um, Bob Nagorny um, in the 90s started doing chemosensitivity testing, uh, which is basically taking live tumor and exposing it in the test tube to multiple different chemotherapeutic agents. Um, there are many other people doing the work at the same time. The science was crappy. The whole field got discredited, but Nagorny and a couple other people done excellent um, work uh, over decades. Um, and uh, in the test tube, you can test different uh, combinations to see what's going to work. Uh, in general, if he finds that a um, tumor is sensitive, uh, that will be borne out 80% of the time clinically. If he finds that any particular chemo is ineffective, that's borne out clinically 90% of the time. Now, Nagorny um, is one of the smartest oncologists in a room of oncologists of a hundred oncologists. He could most often be the smartest one. I mean, he really looks at this stuff deep. He's world class. Um, <clears throat> he's had to. Uh, he's got a tough ego. He's taken a lot of hits from the profession, but it turns out some of his work has actually led to standard of care combinations, um, carbo, uh, gem, gem cytobine, carbo and uh, carbotaxel, um, carboplatin, excuse me. Um, what the larger point that I'm getting to is that um, trials are a crapshoot and the percentage of success, you guys probably know better than I do, but my kind of sense is, you know, maybe 15% would be pretty good. Maybe some trials are higher, but it's kind of a crapshoot. Um, so my sense is it would be rational uh, for my patients. And, and I want to say, I usually don't give any advice to anybody until I've looked into their case for four or five hours. And I don't really know your case or what's going on, but I, I have the general sense. Um, and this is more of a wide open conversation kind of format. Um, to me, it makes sense to um, go the Nagorny route before you go into trials, because you're looking at 80% or 90% um, accurate clinically useful information as opposed to, you know, 15%. Um, so I would go that route first, um, and get his assessment. Uh, the larger issue here is he doesn't care so much about genetics. I mean, he'll look at it. He'll, he'll look at the proteomics. He's, he, he, he looks deeply into what are the mechanisms of this cancer, but, um, He's sort of like Harrison Ford, you know, when that when that scary Arab guy shows up in the in the in the market and he's waving all of his you know Science. swords and stuff like that, he just pulls out his gun and shoots him. Um, Nagorny cares, you know, will the treatments kill the cancer? So he sort of cuts to the chase kind of guy. Well, um, I think you like him. This guy is he's he's great to have on your team. Um, if you've got nodal disease, then it's highly likely that a, a centimeter of fresh tissue, which he needs to get to his lab the following day, um, but a centimeter of fresh tissue um, is probably readily accessible. You know, some patients just can't access it. It's hard to get. Um, so whereas the proteomics is stored tissue, um, he needs, uh, Nagorny needs fresh tissue. But I just sort of insert that as, before you go down the trials um, avenue, um, consultation with him is definitely worth doing. Well, that sounds great. Uh, 
did I spell his name? N A G O R N Y Nagorny. N A G O U R N E Y, Nagorny Cancer Institute. <clears throat> he's got a he's got an old um, what do you call it? He's got an old um, old talk um, TED talk. He's got an old TED talk on his website, but you get a sort of a flavor for him. Thank you and very much. He can much. consult with oncologists. I mean, he's, you know, he's an active, he's not just a lab, he's an active practicing oncologist. So he knows the challenges and, and um, uh, you could probably go down to his setup there and he's got surgeons who, you know, he's worked with for a long, long time. You know, they can work it really smoothly or you can, you know, we can send tissue to him anywhere in the world as long as he gets there the next morning. But to do it on site does have an advantage. You're more likely to get the cells as viable as possible. Um, Rick, Rick Stanton, um, I want to give Rick Davis time to talk. Uh, I don't want to wait until the last to the end. Of yes. <laughs> the yes. Last time. And we've only got 15 more minutes. Yes. Um, so I would ask you to focus on requests, uh, things that you would want from the audience that we'll put in the notes and we'll go out to the people who aren't here today. So if you can frame this more in uh, not so much information, uh, maybe you can put some of this up somewhere, but rather around requests you would have, places you want to go, questions you have. Okay. I feel like uh, I would like to invite Rick Davis to talk sooner than later as well, because uh, he was so influential in my awareness and decision making during the week. So I can frame this, Rick, with uh, as I, these were the recommendations by Tanya Dorf and Randy McKay. When you gave that beautiful talk <clears throat> or suggestions about a pluvicto, like, hello, why wouldn't you be doing something that has, you know, some evidence behind it? <clears throat> it was like shocking because it didn't come up in my three out of three clinical oncologists. So I queried all of them during the week. Uh, I got a response, a beautiful response from Dr. Sandy Liu, who's my current treating one under the uh, uh, docetaxel and the uh, Arcus trial. Her response was, yes, Pluvicto would be a very good option for you. So that is so interesting because until I brought it up, because you brought it up, wasn't even on the radar. And uh, suddenly it's a, a very good option. The other option is a crossover um, that I can actually go to. I can stay on docetaxel with the PD-1 inhibitor and the adenosine. So I wanted to say thank you, Rick, because uh, it, it, I believe um, Raina McKay also, uh, but I got to look at her response specifically. But basically, you fleshed out something that <laughs> that was great. Yeah. So please weigh in here, Rick, because I wanted to say thank you for. It's a pleasure. It's it's what we do. Um, sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees, um, and, and and I I also want to to follow up and thank Dr. Laird because I think he's saying the same thing. Um, you know, we can be looking around and running around in circles in the uh, spiral staircase up the ivory tower. And <laughs> um, there's some really good stuff that's out there. Uh, I don't know. I put Nagorni's link in the chat window so you can go straight to it. Um, I don't know how much experience Dr. Nagorni has with prostate cancer, but um, it, it's an unusual it doesn't behave exactly like everybody else, like other cancers. Um, I'm just looking at this chart and something that Dr. Laird said and, 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 and suggested uh, Nagorni actually came to me simultaneously. Um, your disease was strange from the first place because it's been very aggressive, but it, it only showed up as four plus three. 
Um, and when I say only, four plus three is relatively aggressive, but it wasn't, it didn't have a Gleason over eight. So I am thinking and wondering whether your slides ever got reread, whether Epstein, Epstein at Johns Hopkins ever looked at them, and whether in fact your disease was a much higher Gleason, which would explain right now, and if it was possibly um, introductory disease, um, which, um, which a lot of lesser pathologists don't identify unless you actually ask them to identify it. Now, why would that be important now? Why do we need to know that now? Well, if you had higher Gleason, if you had introductory disease, and you had very low PSA, then there's reason to think that from the outset, your disease um, didn't really behave like an adenocarcinomic disease. And there may have been mutations in there from the very beginning, which didn't allow you to respond properly. Now, one of the treatments that we've seen used in that situation is, um, is adding a platinum-based chemotherapy. And I, I think you're just getting docetaxel right now. And, um, and I would be doing a little more work to look at those cells and see, well, did they look like small cell? Did they look, did they have like a neuroendocrine aspect to them originally or even now? And if they did, maybe we should be adding something to the chemo. Now this is set totally separate from the PSMA discussion, but you know, when we go to these docs who are supposed to be so good and, and they don't see the obvious. And sometimes it makes me a little crazy. Do you, were you diagnosed um, fully in the first place? Do we have all the information in the first place that we needed? When guys come into our group, these are the sort of things we're pushing them to do, to go back to their medical team and to say, have you done this? Have you done that? Did you send, did you send the slides to Epstein? There's nobody better than Epstein to look at, the, to look at those slides uh, in the country, in the world. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is, I mean, I'm really glad that we've got you and hopefully Brian, if we can figure out the right way onto the PSMA path. I mean, when you say you're super sensitive to, to PSMA treatments, well, the place to start is, is clearly um, with Pluvicto. I mean, we've got another gent um, who we hooked into Bryce yesterday, who is about to start, uh, and, and his disease is running crazy, his tumor burden right now, is uh is around 39 so i mean it's just it's going nuts and um he's certainly eligible for pluvicto but he doesn't want to wait to start the four to 12 weeks it could take i'd be very interested to hear by the way from dr lou when she thinks calais is going to be able to start treating patients that's the question we we'd like to to know but he's going into the wild Cornell trial with alpha plus beta particles. Um, and he's starting that next week because time is so much of the essence for him. Fortunately, you don't have that situation. And if it were me, would I go into an alpha plus beta versus Pluvicto? Probably not. Um, Oliver Sartor seems to think that there's, there's potential in that based on what he said in that six, seven minute video. Um, I think it's valid, the alpha plus beta approach. Um, but frankly, um, I, I'd start with what we, what's tr tried and tested. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say about the elaporib, again, you know, the, the, these doctors are just fishing around to see how they can make a cold tumor hot. And the only reason they want, and you've got CD12, so they oh, elaporib. The problem with a lap rib was that it, that that um, in that um, was it was it profound I forget the name of the trial but in that trial that Maho Hussein led they went for a basket approach of approval and they got all these they got all these mutations approved by the FDA for the use of a lap rib but what they didn't 
do is show them which of those mutations were effective and which were not effective. They, they applied for a basket and they got a basket approval. But in fact, the only mutations that were sensitive to the LAPRU were um, BRCA1, BRCA2, and maybe, I think with about 7% of people, ATM. And the whole rest of them, they were not. And now you've got people who are all excited because they've got you know, a power or, a, or an AT or a, or, or a, a CDK12 or something like that. They think, oh, a lap rig's the magic bullet. No, it isn't. And, and you know, I, I, we have to tie these guys back and we have to stop getting these docs to view some of our folks as, as fresh meat because that's driving me a little nuts. So I'll get off my soapbox right now. I think it's a beautiful soapbox, and I uh, want to mention uh, thank you to all because you you mentioned something about your friend who he, he's out of time, you know, and uh, I am happy, very happy to say that I'm currently, you know, whatever treatment I'm suboptimal, I'm you know at least I'm under control for today, and that gives us a chance to be proactive rather than reactive right. i mean when you're in a reactive mode when your parachute fails and you're falling uh it's it's like you don't even have that extra week or two to get the paperwork done to get scheduled let alone exactly let alone figure out what to do exactly uh, so thank you to all of you so much um I will spend one minute and only one minute to, um, on this slide because it's kind of interesting that I've been very lucky to have TGen, Translational Genomics, help me with Nick Shork. Um, so we see these um, possibilities for my next treatment. And again, uh, thank you, Rick, because Pluvicto is now on there. Um, and then I wanted to sh mention the analysis that has happened for me, luckily, because of TGen and, um, and what I'm trying to do uh, moving ahead. So um, from whole, I, I actually had a whole genome sequencing done, not only whole exome. Uh, so we have the tumor burden, we see the fusion, we see the mutation. Um, also done on me was uh, a neoantigen analysis. So similar to Shirley Pepke, um, my buddy Guang Fa at TGen um, gave uh, a beautiful um, neoantigen analysis of my tumor, which is, is plentiful because of the fusions. Uh, and I have a lot of fusions. Um, then the also TGen um, was able to identify the overexpression. Rick, you mentioned I'll be, uh, that I feel that I'll be sensitive to a, a PSMA. I don't know that, but I do know that I express uh, PSMA uh, highly. So that's encouraging. Um, there's a connectivity map going on for me. Uh, there is an organoid study going on for me. So along the lines of testing um, therapeutics on organoids, that's happening. Uh, so this is just very uh, nice analysis that TGen has brought to the table. Here's the last thing that um, I was surprised happily that Raina McKay um, said, hey, how about a uh, um, B7H3 clinical trial? And we know that us prostate cancer guys tend to uh, express B B7H3. So that was the first time I had heard a doctor suggest a clinical trial based on RNA-seq data. So that's kind of interesting. So it's time for me to be quiet. We're almost out of time. Um, Thank you. So Rick, let me just Brad. bottom line this on this last section you just talked about, the analyses you have. So this is data that you have that you could make available or is in process and could be in a short while, hopefully, be made available. If we were running a classic 
uh, bioinformatics hackathon like Alex felt us knows. Um, how could we, do we need to schedule a separate event to do that? When could we do that? How are, how are we, how would you like to approach that? Could you make it available now? How, like sort of what analysis do you want to do on top of the data that you have? Right now I'm struggling. So I'm a ex bioinformatician. Um, so I am, uh, looking at my RNA seq data to do uh, an assessment of my immune composition using uh, libraries in R. First off, this is my data. It's available on a Google Drive. And anyone who wants it can see my, uh, you know, mutational reports, my clinical notes, uh, my HLA types. Um, RNA-seq and transcripts per million uh, from both Asian and Tempus and my Tempus report. So this data is uh, available for anyone who wants to hack on it. Uh, to answer your question, Brad, uh, RNA-seq by next week, I hope to uh, share, you know, my immune composition, which is a poor man's view to answer this kind of question, like, you know, but are there T-regs? Are there CD8s? Um, so you can estimate that rather exquisitely, supposedly, with this immune deconvolution. And if anyone wanted to help on that, that'd be great. One thing here, actually, as I said, there are tons of data on the public domain, and we should learn from those data sets. And I have something to present today, but since we don't have enough time today, but I think there are, there are a lot of things, for, for example, for drug repurposing, there are tons of data and we should be able to use those data. I have one, uh, I've done one, but hopefully I can present it next week for us. Let's do that. Let's do that. That'd be great. Um, out of respect for everyone's time, I'd like to wrap now and stop the recording. Um,